Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second session of the fifth day of Varsiski, our last day of Varsiski. And thank you for joining us for physical sciences and medical physics. Uh, we apologize for the slight delay uh, due to technical issues, of course, as uh, you're all acutely aware over the past few months, technology can be rather fiddly. Uh, without any further ado, I'll pass on to Amanda from the Oxford Physics Society, who will be our host for today. Hi everyone, thank you again for joining us. Um, this is, as I said, our last day, and we hope that you enjoyed the talks that you've been, you, were managed, you managed to tune into. Um, we have a couple of recordings if you want to go back and look at some other things. Um, but yeah, uh, let's get started. This is our uh, last talk on physical sciences and medical physics, um, and we have three talks planned. Um, I'll be hosting the Q&A, so if you have any questions, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can put them in the chat there. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can put them in the chat there and I'll pick them up there, but be aware that there's a bit of a delay on YouTube. So put the question in, uh, questions in early to make sure that um, I get them. Um, so our first talk is by uh, Marco from Oxford. He has a physics background, but he's now doing his DPhil on clinical neuroscience. Um, and he will be talking to us about his research um, that uses EEGs to study the brain under anesthesia. Uh, this is one of the major ways that we can currently study the nature of consciousness, which is, you know, very vague, very new field of study, and we're kind of not sure about, like what we're looking for. Um, so it's very exciting uh, that we have some sort of angle now to 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 um, tackle this problem. Um, and then later in this talk, he will also be talking a little bit about analogies that you can draw between ferromagnets and brains, which I'm very excited about. I've never heard of that. So um, yeah, Marco, I'll give the stage to you. Hi, thank you for that lovely introduction. I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, great, thank you. Um, so, apologies. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, my background is in physics. I just finished my master's here in Oxford with the physics department, and I'm continuing with a DPhil in clinical neurosciences, studying the brain. And so in this talk, I want to just sort of briefly start the discussion by telling you a little bit about EG, what it can tell us about anesthesia and some of the analogies where physics can help us model and tell us something about the brain. And then in the q and I'm also happy to answer sort of more vague and open-ended questions on consciousness and the like, but uh, beware that my, my background is in physics uh, and in neuroscience, not in philosophy. So that's the angle that I would be approaching those questions from. Um, but the thing I want to emphasize is the sort of interdisciplinary nature of this subject. Okay, so let's start nice and simple. Why would you want to do something like brain imaging of anesthesia or BIA? Um, well, anesthesia is not a new topic. We've been putting people to sleep during surgery for about 150 years. So you might say to yourself, surely we know everything about it by now. Well, unfortunately, this is one of the cases where that is not true. Um, the mechanisms, mechanisms underlying anesthesia are still largely unknown in the brain. And the way it's done clinically is mostly based on observational signs. So you determine whether someone is unconscious based on, you know, their breathing rate, their heart rate, blood pressure. And it's relatively uncommon to do anything to do with brain monitoring, even though we know that whatever consciousness ends up being, it will have to be somehow related to the brain. And so the first aim of our group is the, the clinical one. That is, we want to put people to sleep safely with an adequate dose of anesthesia, not to under anesthetize where they perceive the surgery, but also not to over anesthetize where they are at risk of delirium and post-operative complications. And um, we also want to use anesthesia as a wider probe to study consciousness in general. And just to sort of tease to you why this might be a problem where unresponsiveness does not imply unconsciousness, I wanted to briefly tell you about a technique which is called the isolated forearm test or IFT. So this is quite simple. During surgery, uh, patients are often given muscle relaxants so these are drugs that which will paralyze you so that you can't move during the surgery. And so you might naturally ask the question, well, the person might not be moving or screaming, but what if they're conscious, they just can't move. And um, so what you can do is you put a tourniquet around their arm 
And this stops the muscle relaxant, the blockade from reaching that arm, such that during the surgery, the patient is free to move their hand. And you have the anesthetist ask the person, you know, if you feel anything, move your hand. If you feel pain, move your hand. And in up to about a third of hospital cases, real surgeries, they will move their hand. And so some form of consciousness is clearly present. And now I have to point out, you should not be terrified of surgery. Um, you are very unlikely to recall this experience. Uh, awareness with recall is way less than 1%, but it's still an interesting result because clearly it's a little bit more complicated than just, are they breathing, breathing normally? Are they moving, screaming, and that kind of thing. And as I mentioned, we also wanna look at this as a wider pro at consciousness. Okay, so that's roughly the, the motivation that we have. Let's now talk about EEG specifically and what it can tell us about anesthesia. So EEG also not a new technique. Uh, it, it'll be about a hundred years since Hans Berg invented it. And the principle is rather simple. So you put small metal electrodes on the scalp, as you can see on yours truly on the picture on the right. And you are measuring small differences in electric potential on the scalp. And now I shall briefly tell you why that's telling us something about brain activity. So as you probably know, your brain um, moves signals and carries information through ionic currents, through action potentials. And in the outermost layer, in the neocortex, it just so happens that these neurons often fire simultaneously and synchronously uh, in the same direction. And it is these summed ionic currents, which then travel all the way to the scalp, where you detect them on your EEG electrodes. So basically what we are measuring with these small metal electrodes with EEG is this summed ionic activity in the brain, which can tell us about the instantaneous activity at a very good temporal resolution, uh, you know, up to a, a few kilohertz. So basically real time. Okay, so that's roughly what EEG is. How does it look like during anesthesia? So briefly, first of all, when you are awake, your EEG is usually fairly low amplitude, high frequency, lots of alpha activity. So that's this roughly, this characteristic 10 Hertz activity, some gamma, which is about 40 Hertz. And that you can see in panel A. But when you give someone a dose of anesthetics, uh, the, the, what I'm presenting here is with propofol, which is an intravenous anesthetic, the EEG readout changes significantly and you get a presence of these so-called slow waves. So these are much lower frequency, about one Hertz, and high amplitude waves, as you can um, see on there. And obviously there's some other noise and activity superimposed on top of that. And if you keep giving them anesthetic to very high concentrations, you move to the so-called burst suppression regime, where you alternate on a scale of a couple of seconds between these bursts of high activity and these suppression periods of very low brain activity. So clearly the nature of the, what, what the brain is doing changes a lot under anesthetics. And what we want to know is, can this tell us something about consciousness and something about perception of the patient that you are about to operate on? Okay, so here is where our group comes in. So it'll be about 10 years ago now where our first major study happened, where my supervisor and her colleagues, Dr. Katie Warnerby here at Oxford, did something quite unusual. Normally during surgery, the induction of anesthesia you being put to sleep is very, it's a very fast process. It takes perhaps about 10 minutes. But what they did is they did a ultra slow infusion of propofol. So you can see that on this scale, the time scale is about an hour to reach peak dose. And they simultaneously record EEG, what I just talked about, and also fMRI, which is uh, measuring activity in the brain on a larger, on a lower temporal resolution scale. So about a couple, every couple of seconds, and it's based on um, the blood flow in the brain and its magnetic properties. And so this was the, the first study of its kind. And what they found, as you can see in this, in this Fourier transform, is the activity in the different frequency bands as you increase the concentration of the anesthetic. So that's the dashed line, that's the concentration of the anesthetic. And you can see that as we keep increasing it, you get this appearance of slow wave activity or SWA at the bottom around one Hertz. And also the stabilization of the alpha activity around 10 Hertz, which is characteristic for propofol, this anesthetic that was being used. Okay, so let me, let me just briefly focus on those slow waves, which we just saw on those on the slide before. 
And we see what they found is that these slow waves saturate and we call this slow wave saturation. So if you look at power just in that frequency band between about 0.5 and 1.5 Hertz, you can see that as the person is awake, there is a, a very small amount of slow activity. Then they lose behavior. So here they were being stimulated with uh, a laser and they were asked to press a button. And LOBR means loss of behavioral response. And it is only after that loss of behavioral response that the slow wave activity starts rising and it reaches a plateau at a higher concentration and stays there. And if you went to very, very high concentrations, you get a breakdown of that slow wave activity going towards better suppression. But uh, here I'm more interested in the slow wave saturation regime. And as I said, they did simultaneous fMRI. So we can see what uh, kinds of networks are active in the brain. And that's the, that's the panel below it. And you can see that there's a big difference between the brain when it is responsive and the brain when it's undergoing this slow wave saturation. And the key difference is that when you stimulate the brain, an awake brain sort of lights up, you know, for a laser, the, the visual parts of it light up, for the auditory one, the auditory cortex lights up, and you see this sort of activity making all the way to the prefrontal cortex and eventually your conscious perception. This is not the case during slow wave saturation. You do get some um, little bits of activity in the primary sensory cortices, but it does not make it to the higher order cortices like the prefrontal cortex. And you see a breakdown of these networks, which we hypothesize corresponds to the loss of perception. So it is still theoretically, philosophically possible that some sort of consciousness that is subjective experience. But what is interesting to us clinically is that we claim that here you are disconnected from the world. Uh, so even if there is some consciousness, it will be what's called disconnected consciousness because you are not perceiving the surgery or whatever ends up happening to you. And basically, the brain has entered a very simple mode where all of the cortex is undergoing the slow wave oscillation with about one hertz. And the slow wave oscillation itself, you know, was discovered about a, a decade and a half prior to this experiment. And you can see it even on uh, LFP, local field potentials, or individual neurons in, in vitro slices. They undergo this one hertz oscillation, which gets synchronized across the cortex. And rather than having lots of information, as is common to an awake brain, you just have the cortex sort of going up and down, up and down in activity, producing these slow waves. Great, okay. So that's by way of introduction to uh, the analogy between physics and neuroscience. So here's where I come in. So I did this uh, for my master's thesis. We found that yes, you get the slow wave saturation, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because what I've showed you here is this nice S-shaped curve, but we found that when you de decrease the anesthetic again, you get hysteretic behavior, which means that the curve going up is not the same as the curve going down and the concentration to lose this slow wave activity and wake up is different than the concentration to get this slow wave activity and fall asleep or lose perception. Uh, as you, that you can see on the panel in the left uh, from a 2013 paper. And um, you can also see this on other anesthetics, more widely, uh, most one of the most widely used is sevoflurane, which is an inhalational anesthetic. Uh, this is a figure from my thesis. And here you get the soil activity as you go along this curve and you can see that it increases, you get the plateau, but then it decreases. And strangely, as you go back, you go back along a very strange curve. And the model that we were using completely failed to capture this because it was a simple sigmoid. That, that's the black curve. It was an S-shaped curve. And this is clearly inadequate. So this was the issue that I was posed with. And here's what it reminded me of with my physics background. I started thinking about magnetization curves or ferromagnets because here hysteresis is the defining behavior. And so perhaps we could somehow draw this analogy. So this is, this is where it's useful to, to think like a physicist. So here's, here's how the analogy works. On one side, you have the brain, the cortex, undergoing a slow wave oscillation under the influence of sevoflurane, that's the molecule on the left. And on the other hand, you have a ferromagnet, which has a collection of, of domains with randomly aligned spins, and you put it in a magnetic field and slowly align more and more of these spins. So let's see if we can push this a little bit further. So if we just took this at a face value, I can make an S-shaped curve with hysteresis using the same equations as I used for magnetic hysteresis. But it's not quite the same 
because I can also see that the slow wave activity decreases at high concentrations, slowly moving towards the birth suppression regime that I mentioned earlier. So again, drawing on my physics background, I thought, how can you decrease the magnetization of a magnet? And um, as some of you might know with the physics background, you do it by heating a ferromagnet. And you can see, as you might have met in your Connors Meta lectures, if you heat a ferromagnet, uh, then you slowly lose the magnetization that you are able to achieve because again, these thermal excitations are randomly aligning the magnets working against you. And so basically what I thought is that you could think of the cortex in the anesthetized state as a ferromagnet, which is being uh, magnetized by a coil, which also heats up at the same time. And um, so it might seem a little bit contrived, but the underlying mass is exactly the same. And it's something that you perhaps might not have realized had you not had uh, some background in physics. So when I implemented this, I'm happy to talk about a little bit more if you want to know more details. Um, but basically, I implemented a common model of ferromagnetic hysteresis, which is called the Preissach model, um, and modified it to include this um, thermodynamic behavior where at high concentrations, you lose the slow wave power or equivalently, at high temperatures, you lose magnetization. And when you implement this model, um, you can see that it, it's called a hysteron model because it's based on what's called a hysteron, which is this fundamental unit for me corresponding to a cortical column, for a ferromagnet corresponding to a domain. And it flips between the slow wave producing state and the uh, state where it's not producing slow waves. And when you implement this model, not going to dwell on details too much, you get a nice range of behaviors and you can see that you do get these s-shaped curves but you can also get uh, the the decay of slow wave power at high concentrations or even burst suppression or reverse hysteresis and if you implement this you model this sevoflurane patient a lot better and then i uh, implemented this on the data set that was available to us which is about 16 patients um, and the model with this sigmoid model was significantly better than the S-shaped one, which you can sort of see even, even from this single example, because it's, it's capturing the underlying behavior a lot better. And um, so very briefly, uh, I can tell you about what kinds of directions you can go with this. Now, we know that um, in ferromagnets, as in the real brain, the, these units, these cortical columns, the brain is very interconnected, right? So what one unit is doing affects the other one. Similarly, in a ferromagnet, you get coupling between the different domains and domains and spins. So another thing that I sort of briefly touched on in my thesis um, was a coupled model of hysterons. And this, in the analogy, can help you explain why this slow wave state is not exactly homogeneous across the brain, and it doesn't develop homogeneously. So that's one interesting way that you can push this analogy a little bit further. And um, we're also interesting in applying these kinds of models to other anesthetics and other modalities. So I've talked a lot about EEG, but one that interests us as well is MEG, magnetoencephalography, which rather than uh, measuring the electric potential is measuring the uh, magnetic field, the tiny, tiny, you know, billion times smaller than the field of the earth, tiny magnetic fields, where again, there's a lot of physics to do with, uh, you know, quantum interferometry and, and lots of uh, quite hardcore superconductivity stuff. So that's roughly what I wanted to talk to you about. So I hope that I've shown you that it is useful to have a physicist working on consciousness and, and uh, anesthesia modeling and these kinds of things. Um, as I said, I'm happy to talk more about um, consciousness issues slightly more widely, uh, or perhaps details of what we are doing in our group um, that I'll, I shall leave that up to you. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us at Varsity Ski. Thank you, Marco. That was a great talk. And exactly what I wanted. <laughs> Lots of physics. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, send them our way, either through the Zoom chat, if you're joining us there, or through YouTube, um, the comment section there. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, first question. What would be the advantages of using MEG over EEG? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, uh, given that MEG is a lot more expensive. Um, so one 
big advantage is that you get a better what's called source localization. So basically you can spatially tell a lot better where your signal is coming from. The reason for that is that with EEG, as I mentioned, your signal is volume conducted omically to, from where it's created to the scalp. And because of this, you lose a lot of information because you know different parts can interfere with each other and you get a lot of noise. But, uh, and that's because you know, the scalp and the skull um, have resistivities. But on the other hand, with, with magnetic signals, the brain is pretty much, as far as magnetic properties are, con uh, are concerned, very close to just being vacuum or air. And because of this, you don't get as much interference and source localization works better. And so you get a very nice balance between the great spatial localization of fMRI, but that suffers from having a very low temporal resolution and the great temporal resolution of EEG, which all then suffers from the, the spatial um, sp uh, the, the spatial concerns. So that, that's one big advantage, the sort of spatial resolution. And then also you, it's the, the signal itself is complementary because you can, um, the signal you get because of how magnetic fields work and how your detector system works are um, mostly from um, tangential sources rather than radial sources in the brain, but that's a little bit more technical. Um, so yeah, so it's a slightly different signal and it's a, it's a cleaner signal. It's quite complementary to EEG. Cool, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, okay. Uh, next question. Um, how similar is being asleep to being under anesthesia? Huh. Um, so in terms of your own phenomenological experience, how it feels, it's similar in the sense of you're not going to remember much of it. Uh, so, it's, so it's kind of like deep sleep. Uh, in that state, except you wake up with a slight hangover-like feeling rather than being refreshed. Um, so that's the, how it feels subjectively. From an objective perspective, it is a, what we call it a sleep-like state. So it shares some similarities, especially with deep uh, non-REM sleep. Uh, so the N3 stage quite commonly shows these slow waves, for example. So th there are some similarities. But Anesthesia is fundamentally a different state. It is not just being asleep because, I mean, for one, uh, it's quite easy to rouse someone awake from sleep. It is not from uh, an anesthetic. And you can also go deeper where you can, for example, completely extinguish brain activity with, with very high doses of an anesthetic, which is something that doesn't happen. Um, so it is, it, it is in many ways similar to deep NREM sleep. Um, but both in terms of um, how widely it acts on the brain, which networks are disconnects and things like that, um, it does have its key differences. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I think it would, it would be shocking if you could wake someone up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be a great anesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we have some questions coming in from YouTube. Um, first one is from Richard Deer. Am I correct that your histeron model suggests that cortical units in the brain are, are in some sense analogous to ferromagnetic domains? What do you think this means? Yeah, so you are absolutely correct that the model is built on this analogy. Um, that's correct. So, so it is built on the analogy between the ferromagnetic domains and the cortical columns. Um, so we, it started out as a, pro, as, uh, for me at least, as a modeling problem. So it was, you know, here is this sort of slow wave activity curve where have I seen similar curves? How can I sort of um, draw this analogy to be able to model it? So, so in terms of being a very useful trick or a, or a modeling device, that analogy, analogy is absolutely there. In terms of what it means sort of fundamentally or whether you could push this further, I think it's telling us something about um, the sort of, the, for example, the fact that the brain is split into different units, the, the cortical columns, and that they have different states. So for example, slow wave, non-slow wave. Um, I'm uh, beginning to be interested in extending this to a multi-spectral state. So it wouldn't just be a zero, one slow wave, no slow waves, but um, each, each histron would have its own um, sort of full range of abilities. And you could, for example, draw the analogy to um, higher than spin half um, domains, where you could get multiple discrete states. And so the analogy is there, but at least at this time, I wouldn't sort of push it to some sort of grand philosophical unification between, uh, between ferromagnets and, and brains. Um, yeah, mostly a modeling device, 
but it's interesting to see how how the ferromagnet then tells you something about where you might want to look with with the brain uh, yeah thanks yeah it's important to like draw the distinction between like an analogy and oh my god there's some mystical connection here. <laughs> that's right can, that's right i can see like a conspiracy theorist really jump on that <laughs> but be careful um a little bit in that vein, uh, to kind of, I think, asking about like how far can we draw this analogy. We have another question from the YouTube chat. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, may I ask what exactly is the analogous, analogous process to heating of the magnet in the human brain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so let me just go briefly back to this one. Um, so the analogous, um, the, the analogy is between, it's very specific, it, it's between the electrical, uh, the, the, Electrical activity in the of the cortical neurons in the 0 0.5 to 1.5 hertz range, so the slower activity, and between the spins of um, individual domains in a ferromagnet, which is being magnetized and at the same time is being heated. Um, so on one hand, the, the one curve is the slow wave activity, which rises with the anesthetic, and on the other hand you have the magnetization, which rises um, with the external B field with the added caveat that at high fields or high magnetizations, you've heated it uh, or equivalently, uh, you've again, decreased the, the slow wave power. So yeah, it, it's specifically between slow wave power and magnetization, yeah. Uh, cool, thanks. I think I have to answer the question. Um, um, okay. Uh, any more questions? Uh, okay, last question. Um, how easy did you find it to pick up all the medicine knowledge necessary for your research? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, if anyone is interested in sort of this interesting interdisciplinary shift from physics to neuroscience, uh, I'm happy to chat. You can, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, so for me, it was it was difficult in the sense of, um, I didn't know what any of the areas of the brain were called or this kind of anatomical knowledge. Um, but what I found is that the physical, underlying physical principles were a lot easier for me to pick up given that I know physics. So if you, for example, look at say how action potentials are created. And when I started with sort of from the basics of, you know, how signals travel in the brain and how they sum and how EEG works or how MEG works, all of these things are underlined uh, by things like Connors matter physics and electromagnetism, which I was fairly familiar with. And so that bit, that bit was easy. What was difficult was nomenclature. So, you know, what are all of these things called? Um, and the sort of anatomical knowledge. But I found that I think, at least my humble claim would be that I found it uh, a little bit easier to pick up that way than the other way around. I think having a mathematical training, a lot of the, the sort of electromagnetism and, and physics became very useful. And it would have been more, it, it would have taken longer for me to pick up the physics than it did for me to pick up the, say, anatomy, the, the bits I required for, for, the, for this project. I think that's a good point, yeah. So to anyone listening, please don't be afraid to go a little bit out of your comfort zone, especially if you Absolutely. have to train. Absolutely. Um, you have a great background to, to start learning other things. Um, and it might feel a bit intimidating at the beginning, but that's where all the fun, interesting research Absolutely. Happens. And yeah. if I can have a very brief last point, I mean, one thing that I've noticed in our group is that it, it sort of lives and breeds to be interdisciplinary. So, you know, so we do have sort of psychology and neuroscientists, but we also have engineers who would then take this model and implement it in some sort of real-time device. We have physicists like me, who sort of work on the modeling and the underlying uh, signal generation, things like that. We have um, clinical staff, you know, anesthetists and doctors who we who then sort of do the anesthesia for us and, and cut open the patients. So, you know, this group would not be possible if we didn't have people from different backgrounds. And I would very much encourage you to sort of look for opportunities beyond the obvious, you know, particle physics, astrophysics, et cetera. As great as those are, your background in physics um, can open a wide variety of doors, consciousness being one of them. Great message. Um, cool. So we had a very quick follow up question, but apparently that clears itself up. Um, to anyone listening, especially because there's a delay on the YouTube, if you end up having questions, all our speakers are here voluntarily. They want to talk about their research. So feel free to reach out to them. They should be really easy to find online. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Marco. Thanks um, a lot. 
So our second speaker is uh, Claire, who had a bit of a technical issue. Claire, can you hear us? Yep. Brilliant. Um, so she is joining us from Cambridge, the um, Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology Department. Um, so <laughs> she'll be talking about how things dry um, and kind of the maths behind that. So we know that when we have um, something like paint or something that dries, we know that the, the particles arrange themselves in very specific ways depending on their mass. Um, but we've kind of in the past struggled to uh, quantify that. And um, your research has been on kind of finding good numerical models for that. And you'll talk a bit about uh, how you found those, what they look like, and also why that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, my name's Claire. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Cambridge. And I'm going to tell you a bit about my research, which is on stratification in drying films. So that means how particles of different sizes arrange themselves in a film as it dries. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a bit about the problem, the model and the results for different phenomena that are relevant to the problem and what I plan to do next. So a variety of particle arrangements have been seen experimentally in dried films. One that's often seen experimentally is a small layer of small particles at the top surface. As you can see in this cryo SEM image, but it's not fully understood why this occurs. And the motivation for understanding this is that then we would be able to engineer the drying process so that we can get the particles to end up exactly where we wish. So on this slide are some examples of applications where it might be useful to have coatings made up of particles that um, self-assemble into layers in the desired order. So we've got a biocidal coating, the coatings on catalyst pellets, uh, layered car paints, and 3D printing where the film self-assemble as it dries. So in the case of the biocide and the coatings on catalyst pellets, it would be useful to have the biocide and the catalyst coating to stratify to the top surface within the coating. With the car paints, currently there's, there are several layers that are sprayed on one at a time, but it would be much more efficient if we could say just spray on one layer and have the particles separate out by themselves. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's useful and now I'm going to tell you uh, uh, some more about the, the physics behind it. So I'll start with the basic model, including only, physic, only the physics of diffusion and evaporation. But later I'll talk about addition of other phenomena. On this slide, I've got an imagined animation of the process. So initially the top surface is at height h, but there's evaporation of solvent from the top surface at rate e dot. So the top surface will descend over time and the particles will become more concentrated until they become closed packed. So there's a playoff between diffusion and evaporation. The particles which can't diffuse fast enough will become trapped by the descending top surface, but the particles which can diffuse more quickly, they'll spread further down the film. This playoff can be characterized by the dimensionless group, the Peclet number, which gives the ratio of evaporation to diffusion based on the Stokes-Einstein diffusion coefficient, which I've called D. KT is the thermal energy, E is the solvent viscosity. So you'll note that the Peclet number is proportional to the particle radius R. So from that, we'd expect that the large particles diffuse more slowly and that they would stratify to the top surface. So that doesn't quite explain the experimental observations. So I formed a PDE model of the system, starting with the conservation equation for the volume fraction phi of the component I, where I is one or two for a bidispersed mixture. The diffusive flux N can be found by summing over the fixed law components for all the components in the mixture. A grad mu is the concentration gradient. It was challenging to find an expressions for the diffusion coefficient because the stokes einstein diffusion coefficient was originally derived for a single particle diffusing in uh, infinite solvent. But I wish to generalize this to more than one type of particle diffusing in concentrated solution. So what do we do? 
Uh, well, for a bidispersed mixture, the flux can be written in this form, but the 6 pi eta r1 comes from the stokes einstein diffusion coefficient, and the k terms, which we call sedimentation coefficients, by analogy with sedimentation, uh, these account for hydrodynamic hindrance as the film becomes more concentrated. However, analytical expressions for the sedimentation factors are only available, or well, you can only derive them for dilute solution, as was done by Batchelor. But we can adapt these to give functional forms which are reasonably physical for both dilute and concentrated solution. So now we've sorted the diffusion coefficients, the next question is, what should we use for the chemical potential expressions? Following the approach of Brussel, in 1989, I used expressions that relate the solvent chemical potential to the osmotic pressure pi that is valid up to closed packing. So the equation here uh, looks complicated, but it's just the ideal gas law. We've got pi equals nktz, as in modified by compressibility z, uh, which we can give an empirical expression that diverges at closed packing. N is the number density of particles per unit volume. The subscript S denotes the solvent. So mu S naught is the solvent reference chemical potential. Phi S is the volume of one molecule of solvent. And then all the chemical potentials in the system are related by the gibbs duhem equation. So equations in this manner were derived for a drawing of a film containing one type of particle by Routh and Russell. And then Truman in 2012 extended this to two types of particles in 2012, but didn't correctly implement Bachelor's hydrodynamics. So I have extended and revised Truman's equations as I've just described to you. So putting together the equations from the past three slides, we get a system of partial differential equations uh, for the volume fractions of the two components in the system. I then non-dimensionalize these equations to get dimensionless time and space and two dimensionless groups, PECLE1 and PECLE2. The boundary conditions are no flux of particles through the substrate or the top surface. But the top surface is moving because of the evaporation, which is problematic for numerical solution. So we use a coordinate transformation to a frame in which the top surface is fixed at psi equals one. Is it solve the transformed system numerically using a finite volume method. And they also derive some asymptotic solutions, which can be compared to the numerical results. On to results. So here are some example results at low Peclet number, starting with a homogeneous mixture. So in this presentation, the subscript one denotes the small particles, the subscript two denotes the large particles. And on this graph on the y-axis, we've got the volume fraction of components one and two. And on the x-axis, we've got the position of the film. So shown in red, the, the smaller particles and blue, blue lines are the larger particles with the larger Peclé number. So initially, the film isn't that far off uniform, and, but over time, some stratification develops and the film becomes more concentrated. As you'd expect from the physics we discussed earlier, with a purely, purely diffusional model, which this is this, this is the results of, uh, you'd expect to get large particles on top. Uh, so the previous graph was at low Peclet number. If we now increase the Peclet number such that they straddle one, you see that we get greater stratification between the two particles. Increasing the Peclet number further to still, so now both Peclet numbers are greater than one, the profiles become much sharper. And it starts to look like there's a transition front with constant shape moving across the film over time. This suggests that an asymptotic solution in the limit of high Peclet number could be derived using a change of variables to x. And here, p of tau is the position of the front. So following through with this, uh, we derive the asymptotic solution here that's shown in the lighter colours. And you'll see that it compares very well, or agrees very well with the numerical results, which validates the numerical code. 
So one hypothesis that's been put forward to explain the accumulation of small particles at the top surface, which is seen experimentally, is a hypothesis called uh, or a phenomenon called diffusiophoresis. This is relevant in a mixture of large and small particles where the small particles are excluded from a distance RDP around the edge of the large particles. For hard spheres from geometry, you'd expect RDP to be the radius of the small particles, R1, but I'll explore what happens as RDP is varied. Existing dry models in the literature only include diffusion of the small particles and they're idealized, only valid for dilute solution. I added a diffusiophoresis to my model by using the drift velocity, UD, between the large particles and the solvent so that the resulting equations are intended to be valid up to closed packing. And here, gamma 1 is the diffusiophoretic drift coefficient. It's a function of R1, so it's a bit like a diffusion coefficient. So the, the aim is, that, is to determine when diffusiophoresis is important, particularly compared to diffusion. And from the equations, we'll see, we see that it's also a function of just PECLE1 and PECLE2, uh, as diffusion was. So remember from our diffusion model results that we were seeing large particles at the top surface. When we add diffusiophoresis to the model, so here we've got diffus diffusiophoresis plus diffusion, uh, diffusiophoresis acts against this large on top stratification. So now the film is predicted to be almost uniform. This graph here is a PECLE number straddling one. And to see more what the effect of diffusion, what diffusiophoresis was, I tried increasing the strength of diffusiophoresis. So that means increasing the size of RDP. So increasing this exclusion shown size. And you'll see then that small on top stratification is predicted, which suggests that diffusiophoresis is a feasible explanation of the experimental observations. So this is a graph at low PECLE number and if we increase the PECLE number, so the PECLE number is straddle one, it's greater stratification is seen. And now the top surface is nearly entirely small particles. If we increase PECLE again, and so both PECLE numbers are now greater than one, you see the stratification is achieved very quickly. For the early stage, from early stage of drying, we have small particles at the top surface. So since the PECLE number is proportional to the evaporation rate, this suggests that if we have fast evaporation and strong diffusiophoresis, that we should get films with strong small on top stratification. So uh, a larger RDP, as, as we have in these plots, might correspond to, for example, uh, non-spherical particles. So the main takeaways uh, from the results are that with a diffusion only model that we're only predicting large on top stratification, which suggests we need some other phenomena to explain the small on top stratification that we see experimentally. And when we add diffusiophoresis to the model, it is acting in the direction of promoting small on top stratification, but we see that it's strength dependent. So the results do support the hypothesis that diffusiophoresis could be causing small on top stratification, uh, but there might also be other, other factors contributing for example, interactions, which haven't been discussed in this talk. So to see if diffusiophoresis really is important from an experimental point of view, I plan to run some microfluidics experiments. As shown on this slide is a schematic of the microfluidic channels. Uh, the central channel will be about 100 microns across. One experiment that I plan to run will set up a steady state concentration gradient of one component by flowing pure solvent through one side and a solution of the component through the other side, waiting for the steady state to, uh, to appear. Um, and then adding a small amount of the second component to the center of the channel. If the second component is unaffected by the background concentration gradient, then you'd expect it to diffuse symmetrically in the channel. But uh, any observed asymmetry could be measured and would be evidence of diffusiophoresis. 
So that concludes my talk. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Claire. Um, it's, it's always interesting how you have these um, very special um, things where you think, oh, surely drying can't be that complicated. Um, but um, we can see that there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And as you said, as, as you said um, it's also important for some applications. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, again, just pop them our way. Beware of the um, live on YouTube, so put them in earlier rather than later. Uh, and also feel free to send them um, on Zoom if you're joining us there. Um, okay, we have one question here. Is mass at all important in this discussion or are the particle sizes all that matter? Um, you could include a sedimentation term as a, another flux term within the PDEs. You know, I have your diffusion flux, your diffusophoresis flux, and the sedimentation flux. But um, for a thin film, which is what we're looking at here with the coating, if you actually calculate uh, either the dimensionless group or the actual size for the sedimentation term, you'll probably find that it's small. Um, as, uh, and so it is in the systems that we're considering. But if you did have particles where, where the density distance, the difference between them was very large, then uh, it, it would contribute and it, it would contribute in the obvious ways. Uh, you have your particles sedimenting. Um, uh, but then I guess there also effects on colloidal stability. Um, if the size difference is too big, um, then the, and then the problems like aggregation, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the thing to point out is here is again, gravity is so incredibly weak compared to anything else. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks for that question. Um, if you, any other questions? Um, YouTube chat is empty. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't look like anything else is coming. I think that's that's always the, the thing with technical talks. It's hard to like ask about equations um, in this sort of format. Um, but again, uh, feel free to to reach out to our speakers uh, privately if you if you know you want to talk about something later uh, in detail. Uh, great, thank you so much, Claire. Um, thank you. Cool. So our third and last talk for this block is um, no more heavy metals. Light for a greener day. Uh, and for that, we have joining us Paul and Andres Laro from um, the CET for Synthesis for Biology and Medicine. Uh, they always have great acronyms, don't they? Um, he is a grad student uh, there, and he will be talking to us about um, drugs that have historically always relied on toxic metals. And his research that kind of shows that that doesn't have to happen forever. And we can get rid of those toxic metals, which would be great because many of these drugs are absolutely essential for some people to survive and it, it's kind of a shame that they're um, toxic to some degree so um, yeah uh, you ready yeah we're all ready cool can you hear me all right yeah so you're sounding good okay. um, thank you Amanda for that kind of introduction um, so today I'll be talking about block um, later today we have the keynote by Rolf Abweiler on bioinformatics at 4 p.m., which I'm particularly interested in. Um, and then our last block of talks, um, they're both on the effects of antidepressant withdrawal. Uh, that's at 7.15 p.m. Um, and yeah, as I said last time, if you're enjoying these talks, this is not just, um, like we're hoping to make this a once a year thing, but all the societies involved, um, most of them have regular talks. Um, and if you if you enjoy listening to uh, researchers talk about the research that ha that's happening right now, then uh, check out the societies at your university and um, see what kind of talks they talks they offer. Right now, they're probably all free because they're virtual um, and really easy to join. So um, go check out your local societies. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, and I hope to see some of you later at the later talks. Um,